Welcome to the Tech Ed Podcast, where we visit with leaders who are shaping, innovating, and disrupting technical education. People who are not afraid to think differently, not afraid to try something new, all with the goal of securing the American dream for the next generation of STEM and workforce talent. Well, we say it right in the introduction to every single episode of the Tech Ed Podcast that we love people who are disrupting the world of education. I'm your host, Matt Kirkner, and just personally, I will tell you when that disruption benefits underserved communities, all the better as far as I'm concerned. We also love the private equity model. We've talked about this on the podcast. The question, though, for today is what happens when we take the world of private equity and the world of education and we put them together? Several months ago, I was reading my favorite news source, The Wall Street Journal, and I came across this article about a school in Israel that is using the private equity model, or at least principles of private equity, to transform education. I've been looking forward to this episode for quite some time. My guest this morning is Gil Perig. He is the chief executive officer of Darka Schools. We are going to talk all about how he is using the private equity model to disrupt education for the benefit of underserved communities. Gil, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. So we're now streaming this uh, podcast in 105 countries. Our producer, Melissa Martin, let me know yesterday that we added yet another country to that list. And uh, and while we're streaming in 105 countries, it's probably not surprising that a lot of our listeners uh, are in the United States of America. You are in Israel. I know you've spent time in the U.S. If if memory serves, you were uh, educated at, at Harvard for a while and at Northeastern as well. So you've spent time here. Tell us a little bit about how the education system and approach to education might differ between the two countries. Right. So so first of all, I think there are many similarities between things that we are facing here in Israel and uh, things that are happening in the U.S. But if I would uh, highlight two main differences, I would uh, speak about uh, teachers' union. Okay which is a bit different, I think, here in Israel than it is in some of the states in the U.S. Okay. And secondly is the matriculation system that we use in Israel, which is following the British model and not the U.S. model. Okay. So in with the first point, uh, unlike some of the states in the U.S., in Israel, all our teachers are unionized. Okay. Meaning uh, our teachers' union is extremely powerful. We have one teacher's union for high school, for high schools, and one teacher's union for elementary schools. And you cannot run a school in Israel if your teachers are not part of the union, period. Hmm. And many times when I speak with my peers, CEOs of charter school networks in the U.S., that many of them work with teachers that are not unionized, they are extremely surprised how you can even affect change in an environment did you don't have the flexibility to hire and fire as you can in an environment without unions. So, but for us, as I'm always telling them, these are the rules of the game. I mean, I, I just cannot run a school if my teachers will not be part of the union. And I can elaborate later, uh, if you wish, how we are working with the union in order to affect change, because the schools that we are running are schools that really need change. Uh, dramatically any change. So this is one point. And the second point, uh, as I was saying earlier, is the matriculation system that we inherited from the times that uh, the UK was controlling the land of Israel prior to the establishment of the state of Israel. Uh, And this is a system that still exists in many European countries, but does not exist in the US, which basically says that when a student uh, is reaching his senior years in high school, they need to pass a set of around seven exams in a certain grade. And even only if they pass these exams, they will later on get the matriculation certificate, which basically is a testament that they've not only graduated from high school, but they graduated in a way that uh, is controlling a certain uh, body of knowledge. Uh, this certificate is crucial for the future uh, of that student in Israel, because without that certificate, you can uh, not apply for college, you cannot go to university. Uh, so, so the schools are in some ways, especially high schools, are surrounding this task of getting this 
certificate, getting the students to pass these seven exams. It sounds like, you know, whereas in some states here in the United States, education is is forced in some ways to right. create itself and direct itself toward maybe a standardized test or, or a set of standards. Is it, is it similar in that fashion? Am, yes. I, am I getting that right? Totally. So the tests, these matriculation tests are designed by the government. They are operated by the government. And the entire system, in a way, is aiming to that to that end goal of getting the students to pass these exams, which opens, opens of course, a lot of discussion among educators. Is this teaching for testing, et cetera? And how will we make sure that our students are really ready for the world and not just uh, able to pass these exams? So this is a topic by itself. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. And, and it sounds like those two you know, those two differences, at least as you suggest, between Israel and, and some of the states here in the United States, both the organized workforce and and the standardized testing kind of put, I guess, for lack of a better term, maybe some constraints around how you have to approach leading a, an organization like Darka Schools, right. correct? Correct. Yes, because the organization was formed uh, 12 years ago by a group of philanthropists, many of them coming from the private equity world, which we'll get into that in a moment. And, and the purpose of this organization, Darker Schools, was really to, to try to solve a problem which is not unique to Israel. But I think in Israel, uh, uh, we see it in a very extreme fashion. And these are the gaps between what we see happening in stronger communities in the state of Israel uh, to what is happening in the peripheral parts of the country. On the one hand, I think uh, Israel has excellent schools in many places. Uh, there is a reason why the state of Israel is, is perceived as the startup nation. There's a lot of innovation going on in Israel. Uh, a lot of startups being built here, a lot of cool inventions being developed in the state of Israel. And they are all uh, happening because of excellent, I think, teaching and excellent schools. But the confusing fact or the worrying fact is that when you analyze the data, which you actually see that these excellent schools are all uh, located in, in the, the most successful parts of the country. So there's a clear correlation uh, between the level of the socioeconomic of the community to the level of, of education that is provided in these communities. So when you look at the poorer areas of the country, you would not find these excellent schools. So in that regard, when you look at the overall numbers of the country, especially at the matriculation numbers that the country as an average is doing, the numbers are actually very worrying because only 55 or 60% of Israeli students are passing these exams, getting this certificate. And this is an average number. And what it reflects, of course, is the fact that behind this figure stand cities like Tel Aviv, and Ramat Gan, and Herzliya, and Ranana. These are the places in which all these high-tech industries being developed. And these cities are doing 80% matriculation rate, 90% matriculation rate, even higher. And if the national average is around 55 or 60%, that means that someone else is doing 30% or 40% or 20%. And unfortunately, as I was saying, when you look at the numbers and, and the statistics, the answer is very clear. These are the typical peripheral towns of the country the areas in which the poor parts of society are living in. And for us as an organization, this is something which is, first of all, it's immoral, it's injustice, and it's not sustainable also, even if you don't care about morality. And uh, the purpose of darker schools is actually to try to change with the, the trajectory of these schools and to show that with fair funding and with excellent management and leadership, these students will eventually achieve at the same level as, the, as their peers in the stronger parts of the country. You know, it's interesting how many parallels there are actually between the story you're telling and what we hear, what we see here in the United States. But you're right; it's not enough to just look at the average and say 55% are passing the matriculation exam. If if you've got 80% on one end and 20% you know, on the other, that really speaks to you know the fact that we've got some underserved folks that uh, that really need an organization like Darker Schools to, to put them on the right path toward, toward opportunities that should exist for everyone, whether that's in the United States or in the, in the state of Israel. So definitely interested in, in digging into that in a little bit more detail. You know, it, I mentioned in the introduction, Gil, that my experience was all in the world of private equity, or at least a lot of it was for the last, you know, seven, eight years of my manufacturing career. Uh, very, very involved with, with private equity partners that helped us accelerate growth. And, 
and really look at where we were inefficient in those organizations. You've touched on, you know, some of the challenges facing education in Israel. Tell us about, you know, how you're finding inefficiencies in education. Do they, do they exist in the same way in education as they might in a manufacturing process where we use the, the principles of private equity to, to improve? Oh, totally. When I look uh, at these failing schools in the towns that I was mentioning earlier, and we tr you try to analyze what is broken there, usually the answer is combined from two main pillars. The first of all, the first one is funding. Um, the way the system is built in Israel is as follows. The government, the Ministry of Education is allocating roughly the same amount of money per student per school. Doesn't matter where you live, whether you live in Tel Aviv or you live in a remote Bedouin town or village somewhere in the country, you would get roughly the same funding per student, which is around okay. $6,000 per $6, year. $6,000 per student per year? Per year, yeah. Okay. Uh, and when you go into stronger areas, what happens is that the municipality from its own resources will then add supplemental budget on top of what the government was allocating, usually 15, 20% more funding to the school. And when you look at the numbers, then you see that actually it doesn't end there because the parents will also participate in adding some tuition and special payments to the school. So eventually the school will enjoy not, not just the 100% funding of the government, but actually extra funding, both from municipality and from the parents. But when you go to a peripheral town, what you will see is, in theory, you do have the 100% funding, even though we have found in our research that in many of these towns, because they're struggling with so many issues and so many challenges, not even the 100% funding is eventually getting to the school. Not necessarily because of corruption, usually just because of chaotic management of this local tiny municipality that is facing so many challenges, and the budget is coming to the municipality. They're trying to do the best they can. And eventually the schools are getting what they're getting, which is not 100% of what the government was allocating initially. Secondly, the municipality itself definitely is not in a position to add additional resources. And of course, unfortunately, the parents are not also in the position to add any more dollars to what the school is getting. So at the end, what you're seeing is a school which is serving or supposed to serve uh, in good fashion, students that are struggling, that are coming to the school struggling because the families are struggling with so many issues. Maybe they have uh, a lot of deficit in what they've learned in elementary schools or prior to that in kindergarten. And not only that you're not giving them more funding to compensate it, you're actually putting them in a school which is funded less than a parallel school in a strong city, which is completely the opposite of what rationality would tell us should have happened. Right. Makes the problem worse, right? Of course. Of course. So this is this is the first problem, which is pure financial. Are we going to create a situation in which a school in the periphery will not suffer from the funding hit that a typical school in the periphery would get? So here comes philanthropy, again, financed by these private equity uh, generous people, well, basically saying we will create a situation in which the school, no matter where it, where it is located, will get the extra funding that usually the strong local municipality would add or the parents would add. And this is the additional philanthropic investment in that school, which is, first of all, leveling the playing field. You had suggested that in some cases, not all of the state funding is getting to the student. Are they taking that inefficiency out as well? Of course. So once we get the license to run the school. We have the responsibility and the ability to make sure that the entire governmental funding is actually getting to the school, plus the additional investment that we bring in. Now, this additional investment is not huge in terms of the extra dollars that you actually spend in the school. Usually, we spend $600 to $800 more per student on top of the $6,000 I was mentioning earlier. Got it. 15%, 12% more funding. It's not huge money, right, but 10%, part yeah, right. of it, yep. that's, it is completely flexible, and it actually gives the principal the ability to actually be a leader and a manager of their institution. They have control on the entire budget, and with these additional funding, they have the ability to address the real needs of, the, of their school. So this is, this, is, this is the first challenge that we see everywhere we go in Israel's periphery, 
we see the need to additional investment that in theory, by the way, we believe should have been done by the government. One of the things that we're trying to do uh, as an organization using our KPIs, using our proven record of achievements that I will speak about in a minute, yep. we're trying to convey the message to the government that they, should, that they should eventually adopt what we call a differential budgeting model, which will basically say that this additional 15% will not be funded by private people that are just generous to solve the problem of this country, right. but really the government should be allocating their resources in a different way. So really the first pillar, as I was mentioning earlier, is funding. It starts with funding. But the second pillar is maybe even more critical and even more important. And this is the level of management and leadership that you have in these schools. Sure. And I, on that regard, this perception is really coming from the private equity approach. When you look into a failing business and you want to, to make it a thriving business, it always, always starts with the CEO. It For always sure. starts with management. And even if you would pour a lot of money into a failing school, but it will not be led by a strong and powerful principle, we know that nothing really would change there. And what we have seen in our work in the last 12 years, that this is probably uh, the most important component uh, of affecting change in these communities. If the school and the teachers are not led and managed by a principal with the right vision, with all the professional tools of, of managing a school in the right way, uh, unfortunately, things will not really change there. And, and I can give you many examples of schools that we have taken on that were in a completely disastrous situation. And it was clearly because of the principal that was running the school. The funding was an issue, for of sure. Course. But even if we had fixed the, uh, the funding, but we have not taken upon the leadership challenge probably nothing would have not changed. And, and gladly, we're focusing on, on these two main topics. And I think this is what is leading to the uh, really amazing results of our students. So just to reflect a little bit on what, on what I heard and making sure that I'm, I'm following, you know, certainly, and, and it's so many parallels to business, by the way, but, but you know, on the funding standpoint, it, you can have an amazing CEO, you can have the best strategy, measure all the right stuff, but if you don't have adequate capital to be able to execute that business is going to fail. You can have all the capital in the world. You can measure everything. Um, but if you don't have a CEO or a leader who can inspire others, who can bring them along, who can execute, that business is going to fail. That's that's exactly what I'm saying. And you got it exactly right. We are very fortunate as an organization, and I'm very fortunate as a CEO, to have uh, at my board people like Mark Rowan, the CEO of Apollo, I read about him in the, in the Wall Street Journal article, by the way. Right. And, and Dan Azraeli, the CEO of the Azraeli Group, and Sam Katz of TCP, and other business leaders who are all bringing into the table their own expertise and experience and knowledge. And even though my team and myself included are all educators, we are led by, by these great uh, strategists and, and, and business people that are always pushing us to do more with less, to be more efficient, to be more strategic, uh, and to aim high as we can, to measure everything that we do, and to convey this message uh, all the way down to the principals and teachers that are working in our schools. And we now have 45 schools with more than 25,000 students all around the country. This is not a, just a one-time, you know, hit and run intervention in one specific community. We're really trying to affect change in the entire system in Israel. And, and let me give you just one example, I think, which captures really sadly and beautifully, I think, the point I'm trying, I'm trying to show. Let me take you back to one of the first schools that we took upon, uh, which was almost 12 years ago, in a remote uh, town, small town in Israel, right on the border with Gaza. Uh, we, we walked into that building, and this was really the first few months of this organization. Previously, I was a principal before becoming the CEO of Darka School. I was a principal of one of the best schools in the country. It was great not because of me. It was great for years. It is based in one of the most affluent neighborhoods in Israel. And it was enjoying the things that I was mentioning earlier. Extra funding, extra 
management and oversight by strategic people. And my school was doing 96% matriculation rate or something like that. We went on to the, on, onto this school in that remote town. And I sat with the existing sitting principal at that school. And I asked her, uh, what are the data of that school? What are the statistics? What, what have your students achieved in the last summer? And she said 13%. Wow. So you were 96% and this is 13%. Yeah. And, she, and she's 13%. And I was, I was shocked. And, you know, this was my, my early days as a CEO. I tried to be very nice and polite, but still smiling. But I still asked her, I mean, what are you guys doing here? You, you don't have teachers? Aren't you teaching? How do you get to 13% matriculation rate? And her response shocked me, sadly shocked me. She felt attacked and she said something in the lines of, have you seen my students? You're coming here from Tel Aviv. Have you seen the students in my town? And I said, yes, I've just seen them. They, they look very nice. And, and she was like, they're all, and she was mentioning their background, their uh, race background and stuff like that, as if they, these are poor kids. What do you want from me? In a very racist and prejudice way. And I was like, what I want from you is to pick your stuff and, and leave the office. You, you, you're not a principal. You're not an educator. And by the way, you should treat yourself because you, you, you cannot speak about other human beings the way you speak about them. And by the way, I'm not surprised that your students are doing 13% matriculation rate. If the, the head of the school thinks that their students are doomed to failure because they are supposedly not you know as adequate as the peers in Tel Aviv. I'm not surprised that they're not doing right. You know, absolutely anything in school. The teachers are not teaching. Nobody is expecting anything from anyone right. in that school. Well, you're expecting failure before you even start. Let me let me. Add, that's a great story, by the way, Gil. And let me as, as we go a little bit more down the path of Darka schools. You mentioned 45 schools, 20,000 students. If I got the numbers right, tell us just a little bit more about the structure and kind of how you ended up there. So the process in Israel of actually running a school goes through a tender legal process. High schools in Israel are run either by the local municipality, again, funded by the Ministry of Education, but they're actually operated either by local municipality or by a network of schools. If the municipality makes the choice to hand it over to others to manage the schools for them, they would then go to a legal tender process in which they invite networks such as us to be running the schools for them. So the process is usually driven by the mayor or by the leadership of that community that feels that they don't have enough capabilities or professional capabilities to be running the schools. And they're inviting network of schools to be doing this work for them. We're the only pure philanthropic network operating schools in Israel because we are the only network of schools that is not charging management fees or overhead from the government's allocation, not to mention the additional investment that we put in. And we're the only network that is focusing only on Israel's geosocial periphery. So our investors in on that regard are not looking for immediate financial profits. They're, they're looking for other probably emotional, social profits for, for the community we, we all live in. And we all are so grateful to them for, for making this choice. Uh, so they cover our overhead and they allow us to put these additional investments uh, into these schools. So we started in the first year with seven schools. We grew gradually up to 45 schools, 25,000 students. Uh, and gladly after really a very quick period of time, we have succeeded to show with our data that what was believed to be a situation that cannot be changed, that these poor communities will always uh, perform in such a low level. We have succeeded to show after one year or two that, that our numbers are improving Perfect. dramatically. So just to go back to the story I was mentioning earlier, after I fired that principal, we brought in a principal, a strong principal from Jerusalem. And in one year, the school has changed from 13 to 55% matriculation. In one year? Just in one wow. year. And in one year, you cannot you know, change everything in school. Yeah, exactly. But, but what you can do is, first of all, set a vision to the school. And they believe that the stu these students are not, you know, different than their peers in Tel Aviv. And you set expectation from yourself, from your teachers. She set criteria, KPIs. We provided her all the support she needed. And they've improved from 13 to 55. And I'm 
So I'm proud to share with you that in the last summer, after 11 years, that same school has reached 95% matriculation rate. Unbelievable. With the same student base, the same community. I mean, none of that changed. Same families. None of, none of that have changed. Same families, same backgrounds. By the way, same level of poverty. And, you know, we believe that the Almighty is not giving talent based on where you live and, and who are your parents. It is really all about, you know, the level of teaching in your schools. And, and there are smart kids in Tel Aviv and there are struggling kids in Tel Aviv. And there are smart kids in, in these poor areas and there are struggling kids in these poor areas. And the question is, what is the level of, of the school and what is the level of management and leadership? And are you putting these kids to success or to failure? Um, so gladly as a network, we have reached last summer a, a network average of 93.5 matriculation rate. And this is a staggering number. No, no one has ever achieved such a high level of achievement in a network of schools in Israel. And again, these are all students who live in challenging areas, Jews and non-Jews, Arabs and Muslims and Bedouins and, and Jews and Christians, religious and non-religious. We serve all communities in Israel uh, with one premise, with one purpose, to offer excellent education uh, to these students and to show that once you fix, as I was saying, the funding of that school and the management of that school, and you introduce innovation into the school, which I'll speak about in a minute, right. uh, eventually you will, you will see results from these students at the same level of students in, in stronger areas. Yeah, those, those results are absolutely stunning. When you talk about going from 13% to 55% in a year, um, that's just amazing. So now let's talk about how you do it. You say, well, we've got to make sure that we've got the funding. We've got to make sure that we have the right leadership, but we also know that it takes a great strategy and execution and measuring the right things in order to drive that kind of change. I'm assuming that, but you can tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me a little bit more about how you went. I mean, just in that one example over the course of a year, getting that kind of improvement. Right. So again, we're, we're using terminology of the private equity world. And, and the first time we did that, people were looking at, our, at us at all. I mean, what these guys are talking about, we started to do a due diligence. Even, you know, using the term due diligence in a school right. sound a bit weird and awkward, but this is exactly what we did. We, once we took on the school, we did a thorough research of what was happening in the building. And clearly, not everything was broken. There were some good teachers there. And there, there were some things there that were at least trying to move in the right direction. And you try to identify what was broken and what was the positive things that you could have built on. So, so the first process is always a thorough due diligence of that school. And when I say due diligence, I mean to all aspects of the school. Many times school principals or educators are drawn into looking only at the pedagogical aspects of the school, which is completely understandable. This is a school, this is the business to provide education, but you cannot look aside from other aspects of the school. For example, the financials of the school. Who is running the financials of the schools? How are they run? Let's look at the marketing strategy of the school. Let's look how the school is working with the community. Is it working with the community? What's the role of the parents? Um, we are always looking at the physical outlook of the school, which is also crucial. Right, physical outlook, you're meaning how, you know, like the physical experience, how does it look from the outside? What's yeah, the outside? yeah, how does the building look like? I mean, sure. is, there, is there a lot of uh, dirt? Is, is, is the school sending the message of an organized place or not? Yeah. Is there chaos? when you walk into the building? What's the safety situation in the school? What's the security situation in that school? We're trying to look in all of these different aspects and, and trying to figure out what is there, what is not there. Maybe you know, there's a wonderful art teacher that is already doing some great work on the walls and on, on the school and you can work with him or with her to expand it. Maybe there's a great sports department in that specific school that you can build upon. So we really try to look at the school from a holistic point of view on all aspects of what it means to be a school in, in, in the postmodern world. And then after doing all of that, you try to set an intervention program, an immediate intervention program. And you set the goals with the existing leadership 
we always try to involve the community in setting up uh, this plan. We always sit with the students and the parents and the leadership of that community. And first of all, we try to hear what are their dreams. Since we're serving so many different communities, we are not trying you know, to force them into one specific ideology or way of doing things. The only message we keep on telling them is the message of excellence. We want your kids to be the best they can. Now tell us, what are your dreams for your students? And many times part of the work that you need to do is really to break a kind of a troubling mindset that this community is stuck in. And it's all about educating the community too, explaining to them um, how will future look like for, for their children and how they need to be prepared. So after crafting this vision together with the community, we then, as I was saying, tailoring an intervention program, which is aiming always both to look at the long-term, where they will be three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, but I'm always insisting, we are always insisting to have initial immediate results as fast as we can. Because it's all about, as I was saying, changing the mindset of that community. And we wanna walk in into that building promising a message that they will see after a couple of months that is actually happening. We need them to be on board and we need to provide them with these early wins as we know in business too, in order to create this positive momentum. So again, from 13 to 55 is huge, but honestly, 55 is not good enough. But for, but for that community to show this graph and to show them, listen, our students did more than four times better than the previous year. Imagine what will be in this community five years from now, eight years from now. And gladly, we are now showing that it's actually happening. And you're building that immediate support right out of the box, right? So you've got, you know, now you've got the community, you've shown these, these immediate results. People recognize that the system is working. To your point, there's still a lot more to do, you know, 55% to the 96 or 97% that you enjoyed at the, the school you referenced earlier. I want to dig into, you mentioned KPIs a little bit earlier for our audience. That's key performance indicators, another term we use in both private equity and business to say, how are we doing to, to figure out what we're measuring? And, and so I'm really curious about, as you look at transforming education, as you look at reaching the, the wide variety of students and communities that, that you're reaching, you know, all of them in, in underserved populations in one form or another, what are you measuring within the educational institution, within the school yeah. to drive performance? So first of all, in Israel, the matriculation figure is critical and crucial. Everybody in Israel is speaking about the matriculation average of their town, of their school, of their own student. This will define what will happen to the student or this community in the future. Will they go to university? To which department they will go? So really the first KPI is really about that, as I was saying. First of all, we measure how many kids are graduating with matriculation uh, certificates. The second one is dropouts. Which, which is extremely crucial uh, because we know that one of the easiest tricks that schools in strong communities are doing, they're kicking out you know, struggling students and then our numbers are getting better. We are making sure that our principals understand, first of all, that they are, that they are not allowed to kick away students that are not performing. Uh, unless we're speaking about a very violent student that is really harming others. But if a student is not performing, the solution is not, you know, to send them out. So we're looking at dropout rates at the school. We're looking at enrollment, which is also very interesting and very important to understand how the market, so to speak, looks at the school. Our parents are choosing to send their kids to that school, yes or not. And we all are also measuring something which sounds a bit fluffy or not really uh, quantitative, but is very, very crucial. And this is what we call the climate of the school. This is a, a more of a qualitative component of a school. And we do it by using a, a detailed questionnaire that we make our students fill every year in that community. And we do it in all of our schools. And this very thorough and detailed questionnaire is looking into all aspects that are not measured by exams. So for example, are you feeling safe in school? Have you seen a violent incident in your school? Do you feel encouraged by your teachers? Do you feel loved by your teachers? Is someone there 
caring for you. These KPIs are important. This is not just collecting data for the sake of collecting data. Later on, you sit with the principal and you say, hey, take a look at the 10th graders. We have an issue there. We need to do an intervention specifically in that grade to make sure that students are feeling safe when they go out uh, between the different classes. Something is happening there. You should be aware of that. This is not you know, about punishing the principal. This is just helping him to better understand what is happening in the school. So, you know, the community wants you to be there. You want to be there. The students are clearly benefiting from the experience. What's been the reaction of the teachers within the school inside of that bargaining unit? So it's interesting. Each time, each time we walk into a school, we always get this immediate nervousness, usually from the teachers. Yep. By Another parallel to private equity, by the way, when the private yeah, equity guys yeah, show up, yeah, the company, of course. company gets nervous yeah. as well. Here, go ahead. Who, who, is the, who is this organization? Who is this company? What, why are they here? What is expected from me? Is there a hidden agenda? Will they preserve mm-hmm. my rights? And as I'm always, you know, telling my team, there, there's a beautiful book I once read when I studied in the U.S. The title was, If You Don't Feed the Teachers, They Eat the Students. So <laughs> we start with the teachers. <laughs> yes, it says, says it all. all. <laughs> so it always starts with the teachers. We start by sitting with the teachers. First of all, explaining to them who we are, what's our vision, why we are here, that there, there's no catch in this story. Nobody's trying to cut profits from, from your salaries. And then we, we convey to them several promises that we try to keep in, in, in a very strict way. First of all, that... No one will, you know, will will suffer immediate, you know, uh, uh, negative effects in their compensation. We're going to maintain your compensation, and on the contrary, contrary, what we're what we're showing them, and we really start there. We start with the very basic Maslow things, you know, their own ability to provide their families. You will not be harmed by who we are. We show them our financials. We show them that we are a stable organization. We know what we do. Gladly now, after 12 years, it's easier for us than it was four sure. years ago. And right, with a track we, record, you bet. Yes, of course. And also, you know, sharing with them who are the financial, who is the financial backing of this organization and why we do what we do. And then we're adding a couple of more things that, that when they hear them for the first time, they're a bit surprised. And, and actually, the first time I did that, I got a call from the head of the union really a couple of hours later. I was sitting with the teachers of one of our first schools, and I told them, not only that we're going to give you your regular salary, we have just launched a welfare fund for our teachers. Hmm. Meaning, if you are a member of the DACA network of schools and you are struggling, no matter what is the reason, we will be there offering you loans, grants to support you. Sure. So we believe that you are you are the people that are actually doing the work and we need to be here for you. And by doing that, what I tried to do was really to, to send them a message of what we expect them to do to our students. It was kind of a role model to them of, you know, we see you, we hear you, we care for you. And I remember after doing that, the head of the union called me, the head of the Israeli union. I mean, to get a call from the head of the Israeli union is kind of a right. frightening call usually. <laughs> yeah. He's been here for decades. He's seen it all. And he's like, Gil, is this true that you're actually going doing a welfare fund for teachers? I said, yes, it is true. But he said, it's huh. not in the contract. I said, yeah, <laughs> but we still want to do it. Right. You're not against, I hope. He said, he said, no, no, no. I was just making sure that what I heard is correct. And I think going back to the point of working with the union, this was one of the first moves that we have done. And gladly, we we got the support of our board to continue to do on a regular basis year after year. And every month we are offering support. You know, you don't have to do it to all your 3,000 employees. We have 3,000 teachers working for us. You do it for four, five teachers a month. Mm-hmm. And you do it in the street. But they tell their friends. Of course. Their friends tell their friends. That's the amazing thing. We never had a strike in our school for 12 years. And I'm not telling you that it's an easy, you know, sure. process. But at least it, it, we, we have found a working solution that the union respects what we do. And we understand, we understand the rules of the games, uh, as I was saying, and, and we have to work within the system. Another parallel, though, the manufacturing companies that I ran, one of which that I ran for, for 10 years was a uh, 
for most of that tenure was a, a unionized company. Actually, the the union decertified late in that in that process. That's a story for probably three or four podcasts put all together. But but certainly, when you find ways to work with the leadership and you share common goals, uh, leadership of the of the union and is certainly in a school. Um, you know, it should go without saying that the common goal should be to educate students and create futures for those students. And when you share that common goal, you may differ in some cases on the approach, but if you share the goal and, you, and you're open to communication and you're successful as you have been, um, obviously then, then the, the team members, whether that's a manufacturing company or, a, or an educational institution are going to come along. I do have one final question for you. And again, I wish we had even more time for, for our discussion today. It's been a, a wonderful one and, and you're doing such innovative things. It's a question that we ask every single guest here on the on the Tech Ed podcast. You know, here in the United States, we call them a high school sophomore. That would be somebody you know in their uh, their second year of high school, a fifteen or sixteen year old child. If you had one piece of advice for somebody in that age range, that that high school sophomore, 15, 16 year old, what would that piece of advice be? I would say invest in humanities. I think humanities are, for so many reasons, a bit neglected in our era. And uh, everybody's just looking at the high-tech industry. I don't want to become a software engineer and the, to be doing an exit and all that. And it's great. I'm a, I'm a big I'm a big believer and personally early adopter of technology. But I think when you, you when you hear from CEOs of our of our great tech companies today, they would say that the next generation of employees will have to be people, people coming from background of philosophy and critical thinking and arts and humanities. So this is what this is what I tell my own children, and this is what I would tell that students. Invest in humanities. Don't neglect math. Don't right. neglect physics. Don't neglect coding. But don't forget how important it is to learn Plato and to learn literature and to learn how to think. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting that you you bring it up in that fashion. And during my business school years, I point to people, you know, especially like when you were early on interviewing for new jobs and they'd always ask you, what were your favorite classes? And they would expect you to say, you know, some accounting class or marketing or finance class. And I always pointed to um, to my theology classes. I took nine, nine credits of theology and nine credits of philosophy as at least in that part of my pathway the most valuable courses I took because they, to your point, they taught me how to think critically. They, if you can communicate on, you know, writing a, a term paper about Plato, if you can communicate on things like, like theology, you can, you can communicate on anything. So, so the importance of both, we certainly aren't going to steal anything from the importance of, of hands-on skills and technical knowledge and so on here at the tech ed podcast. But I really like the way that you answered that question. And I really like the fact that you spent some time with us here on the tech ed podcast skill, just a fascinating approach to education so much that our nation here in the United States, our educators can learn from you. Educators around the world can learn from you and your model. Thanks so much for being on. Thank you so much for hosting me. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Tech Ed Podcast. If you haven't already, subscribe, leave a review, and if you like this episode, share it with a friend. New episodes launch every Tuesday, so listen in next week.